let the world know we love them than to introduce them to Jesus Christ. So uh, Luke chapter 2, last week we looked at the second part of Luke 2 and we discussed Anna and Simeon a little bit more. Simeon, we, I don't really think we got, we didn't talk much about Anna, but today we want to look at the birth of Christ. Next Sunday, I told you, is Christmas Sunday. Some of us might be out of town or not available and we're having more of a program than a sermon. So today I would like to discuss the beginning of Luke chapter 2, the first 20 some verses. No promises about us getting through it, but I hope that we do. I uh, get through Luke 1, uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. And as we look at these verses today, as so many of us are so accustomed to the Christmas story and to Christmas and to all that goes with it, I do want to kind of just really focus on this incredible, incredible gift that God the Father has given this world, the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ. And uh, some weeks ago, I had mentioned how as kids... I think if you ask most kids what's their favorite holiday, probably a lot of them would say Christmas. And I think that would be true of even many adults would say Christmas. As I get older, I find that Easter is eclipsing Christmas uh, in my favorite holidays. We don't celebrate, the world doesn't celebrate Easter as much as we do Christmas. But the gift was incredible. But Jesus coming back from the grave and forgiving our sins and taking his holy blood to the holy of holies that's in heaven to that tabernacle, make an atonement for our sins. That's an incredible, these two holidays together. And I say that because it's hard for me as I get older to think of Christmas without thinking of Easter. And we're gonna, we may discuss that if we're going to get to it today or not, but we may, we may look at some of the tie-ins there. But in any event, uh, Luke chapter 2, I'm going to read these first couple verses, probably three verses or so, and then we'll stop and talk about them a little bit, and then we'll pick it up again. In Luke chapter 2, Verse 1, now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census should be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each according to his own city. We start this chapter, in chapter 2, we start with a, a story of the world. It said all the inhabited world, Caesar Augustus, as many of you know, was the adopted grand nephew of Julius Caesar. Uh, Julius Caesar adopted him and his own son, it was actually his grand nephew. And uh, often as the Roman Empire became the dominant force of the known world and the power and the Roman army and, a lot, and all that went with that, uh, they were looking for a man-made world power system. Uh, I will tell you, the man's done that for many, many times. In the Old Testament, the Tower of Babel, it said Nimrod. God had told them to go out and disperse around the world, and it happened the whole world. And they said, let us build a city for ourselves. Let's make a world empire. And as many of you know, Babel, Beb, means door, and El means God. It was man's goal to build a doorway to God, to build heaven on earth without God. We can do it on ourselves. And that was really kind of the story of the Tower of Babel. And then we saw it with the Roman Empire. We've seen through time where people want to dominate the world, uh, not for godly purposes, but for humanistic uh, purposes. And we see it here. And I was thinking of, the, and, and I say that to say that as Rome became a world power, and uh, Wednesday night in Bible study, we talked a little bit. We're going to read Galatians 4 in a little moment. But it, it says in Galatians 4 that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son to be born of a virgin. He was born under the law so that those who are under the law could be redeemed, that we might have adoption as sons. And we mentioned that uh, Wednesday night in Bible study, and when it says in the fullness of time, and we went over some of that, why was that the right time? Well, obviously the easy answer is because God said so, and, and you would be correct. But when you think about it on a timeline of the world's history, Rome was probably the pinnacle of the world system. Greece had come in, Alexander the Great, maybe you know your world history, Alexander the Great had come in and the Greeks had come in and ruled the world basically from India all the way to Scotland and most of the known world, Europe, Asia, Central Asia, the north of Africa, the whole world was ruled by one person. At that time it was Alexander the Great and then some of you are probably aware that when his empire fell apart he had four generals, those generals kind of chopped the world up and uh, they tried to take over, and then the Romans had come in, and J uh, Jerusalem at this time was under Roman occupation, under Roman rule. 
And many of you might remember the term from your world history, Pax Romana. It was the Peace of Rome, P-A-X Romana, the Peace of Rome. They had a one-world government system. They had a one-world government language. It was Greek. Uh, we had talked Wednesday evening about that a little bit, how most languages as they develop, they decline in being technical. The Greek language became more technical because you didn't have the cultural background. You had people from literally India possibly talking with people what we would say today is Europe or England, and they had to have a language that was very specific. So the Greek language actually got much more technical, and if you were to ask someone today, which language would you write a document in that would last 2,000 years, it was technical, they'd probably say New Testament Greek. It's a very specific language. So when we read that in Galatians, the fullness of time, God sent His Son. You had the Roman road. You could travel from Scotland to India on, on the Roman road and not be worried about passports and what governments you were entering. It was one world system. And God used that one world system to expand the gospel, as we know Paul did many times. But again, as we look here in this world history, these first three verses are covering world history. It says there was a, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, the ruler of the world. And it was interesting that I was thinking about that this week. He sent a, a rule out that said, everyone has to come to me or to their hometown, I should say. Everyone has to go to their hometown for a, ro a, a role to be taken. What was that role for? Taxes. So he, and, and Caesar Augustus, who again was the adopted grandnephew of Julius Caesar, he was often called the savior of the world. He's the one that when the Greek empire kind of fell apart, he's the one that kind of brought it back together. People say, hey, the whole world was falling apart. All these wars happened. All these wars were going between the four generals and Caesar Augustus brought it together. You might remember from your world history also Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, that was going on kind of in this window of time and Rome had won and it was like we're, we're still all together or one big unified world government. I have a quote here and one of the quotes listed back then it says, whereas the providence which has guided our whole existence and which has sown such care and liberality has brought our life to the peak of perfection in giving us Caesar Augustus whom it filled with virtue for the welfare of mankind and who being sent to us and to our descendants as a savior. He put an end to war and has set up all things in order. He is the savior of the world. That's the time Jesus was born. That is kind of stunning to me that 2,000 years ago, the mind of man has said we've reached the peak of perfection and the gods have given us a God in human flesh called Caesar Augustus, and, and he is the savior of the world. Folks, he is, there's no man-made system that's the savior of the world. It's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And at this monstrous lie from the pits of hell that came in at this time 2,000 years ago, God sent Jesus in. Who do you think had by world's vision the most power? By worldly standards, Right as this was going on, Caesar Augustus was called the savior of the world, had the Roman Empire under his command, had ultimate authority, and a little baby is born in a manger. By worldly standards, who do you think had the most power? <laughs> Not by worldly standards, he didn't. By spiritual standards, by godly standards, we know who had the most power. But the world so much misses things. And when we hear this phrase, Jesus is the reason for the season, that's not just a trite little phrase that we say. Jesus is the reason for the season. There would be no warmth of our hearts. There would be no joy. There would be no hope that we had had Jesus Christ not come into this world. We would be miserable. And that's what the world was experiencing for these thousands of years. Just think in their mindset, the Savior of the world demands you travel hundreds if not thousands of miles back to the city of your birth and be enrolled so that you can give me taxes. For God so loved the world that he gave. God's system is completely backwards in the system of this world. This world demands from you, God says, here's a gift, here's grace. Do we all know the verse, it's more blessed to give than receive? We have the example. God loved us so much he gave. Julius Caesar says, I loved you all so much I took. Two radically different, different perspectives. But it shows us the history of the world here. And then in verse 2, it says, this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. 
I think a year or two ago we'd mentioned this, that in uh, 1700s the archaeologists had discovered, some people were starting to say, well, you know, uh, Quirinius was uh, governor in 8 AD, and it couldn't have been the time Jesus was born. Look, the Bible's got a fault in it. There's a flaw. Well, then in 1700, they found out, guess what? He was governor twice, once also in 6 AD, and then also in 8 AD. And so that when they made this uh, census here, it says the first census was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Julius Caesar in the Roman Empire had required that all nations did this enrollment every 14 years. We still do it to some degree in our culture today every 10 years when the census comes and mine goes right in the trash can. That's another story. <laughs> uh, and, and I think I mentioned how a year or two ago during COVID, I think I still got the letter in my desk drawer, but uh, Lena Hildago sent us a letter here at our church and said, I want a list of all your church members. I want their address. I want their phone number, their email, contact information. And I had mentioned to you, you're welcome to call Houston and give it to them, but I'm not giving it to them. But why they would need our list of our members, I'm still perplexed, but the answer was no. And I tell you this, say, that's how Ju uh, Jerusalem was. Israel said, y'all can have whatever census you want, we're not going to partake. So for many years, Israel did not do a census. At this point, it finally became, Rome said, we demand, the rest of the world's doing it, everyone's doing it, but Israel, we demand that Israel now also does a census. Of all the times... Of all the times that Jesus could have been born, it was the time that required them prior to this minute, at this time, at this year, at this night, that Jesus was born. They had to go to Bethlehem, and they, and they did. And so this history of the world in verses 1, 2, and 3, and it says that everyone was on his way to register for the census, each according to his own city. So it goes from a worldview, a very big worldview, to now a very tight view of a family. Now we have the story of a particular family in verse 4. And in verse 4 says, Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. Now, some of you may say, I thought Jerusalem was the house of David or the city of David. It was later. David was born in Bethlehem. And as they were traveling, I couldn't help but think, and roughly, uh, I wrote the year down here in 1553 is, uh, B.C., as you might recall, when Rachel... Uh, cried out for a baby son, and she was born in Bethlehem, and of course she had the 12 tribes, that, well, she was the wife of Jacob, who was the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, but in 1500, Rachel had cried out for a son, and I have to believe as Mary had seen the angel and talked to the angel, and the angel told her, there is a baby going to be born to you from a virgin, you're not been with men, you're still going to have a baby, uh, and it'll be from the line, it'll be from God, but it'll, it'll come all the way down, he is the son of David. And I couldn't help but think as she's going to Bethlehem thinking, this is the city that King David a thousand years earlier had been born in. I know here in the States we think like 250 years ago was a long time. It's not over there. Some years ago, I shared this with some of you, I was over in uh, Damascus, Syria, and they have a big rock wall and there's a, some rocks missing out of it. And they said, this is the window that Paul hiked up out of. And when he was trying to kill him in Damascus, they were trying to kill him. And I put my hand on that rock, and I thought, you're telling me Paul was right on this rock right here, and this is the window he snuck out of from Damascus. And they said, that's the one. I said, well, how do you know that? That's, that's 2,000 years ago. And they said, well, the wall is 5,000 years old. 2,000 years isn't a big deal to us. <laughs> I know. It was stunning, that timeline. But in any event, so 1,000 years prior to this, uh, uh, in, in, well, in 15, uh, BC, 1500 B.C., Rachel cried for, out for his son, and as they were traveling from Nazareth, way up in Galilee, they were going down to Bethlehem, which is about five miles away from Jerusalem. Bethlehem is about five miles away from Jerusalem. Nazareth to Bethlehem is about 90, 85 to 90 miles. As they were traveling down, they would have passed a city called Shiloh. And I also got thinking, I couldn't help but think that as they were going by Shiloh, they said, this is where the tabernacle used to be. Remember back in Samuel where Hannah went to Shiloh, and every year it said they would go to Shiloh and make sacrifice. And, the, and she said, I, I want a son, I, I need a son, and Samuel means God hears, Shamuel, Shema Uel, God hears us. And she named her son Samuel, and she cried out for that son, uh, and, uh, and then of course her son Samuel, who was born to her, does anyone know what Sam, Samuel's famous for? Who did, who did Samuel anoint in Bethlehem? King David. Samuel's the prophet that Hannah 
cried out for and asked God, give me a son. And Hannah had Samuel. And Samuel's the one that God told Israel, said, we want a king. We want a worldly king. We want a king like the nations around us. We, we want to look like the nations over there that have kings. And you remember Samuel went and cried out to God and said, God, they've rejected me, a prophet that led Israel. And you might recall what God told Samuel was, they didn't reject you, they rejected me. God was the king of Israel at that time. But the people of God said, we want an earthly king. We want someone we can see. We want to be like the nations around us. So Samuel was, was brought up through Hannah, and then Samuel went down to Bethlehem and was looking for David. Remember, you might remember the story. He went to Jesse and said, Jesse, one of your sons is going to be the, the king of Israel. And they brought all the sons in. And he inspected them and said, no, not this one, not this one, not this one. Finally got to the last son and said, none of these are the ones that will be the king of Israel. And Samuel asked Jesse, do you have any more sons? He goes, well, I got this one little boy named David, the little run of the litter of my boys. And he's out in the, he's out in the fields tending the, the flock. He's just watching a few little sheep out there, David. I love that story because if you ever read that story, it says God was looking for a man to be king of Israel. By God's standards, David was a man that was going to lead Israel. By man's standards, Jesse said, well, I've got this one little boy that's just entrusted to a few little sheep out in the fields. And in that city of Bethlehem, David was a shepherd. In that vill village and surrounding area, he shepherded sheep there. <clears throat> and we come down through time, th as we go through uh, chapter uh, 2, verse 3, it says, of, of chapter 2, verse 4, so Joseph went from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea. And we read those 12 words, give or take, but there's so much history there of that, that 90 mile travel, I couldn't help but along the way they're walking and talking and passing Shiloh and say, oh look, here's where Hannah cried out for the prophet Samuel and King David was anointed by the prophet Samuel. And here we are headed to Bethlehem because King David is in our family lineage. And we're going to the same city that King David was born in. And King David had a great opulent kingdom. And now here we are thousand years later under Roman rule and we're downtrodden. We're making this journey with Mary right at nine months pregnant, making a 90 mile journey by foot, maybe on a donkey, traveling 90 miles. I can't believe how difficult that must have been. Probably pretty difficult. In verse five, it says why they went, they went, they were complying with uh, what Caesar had ordered. In verse five, it says they went there in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. While they were in Bethlehem, they arrived at Bethlehem. We all know the story. Larry, the innkeeper, said there's no room in the inn. The inn's all full. But I might have a, uh, his name was Larry. Yeah. I don't know if he's out there somewhere. There he is right there. <laughs> and, uh, but he did give him a, uh, a manger to put in. A manger might have been a rocky outcove, might have been something wood. We don't exactly know, but it was an area they would keep animals at night. And they kind of lock them in, and they had food troughs and things in there. And they said, we can put you out in the manger with the animals. Uh, and they went there, and it says, with the, verse 6, while they were there, the days were completed for Mary to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And so now there's the story of this worldwide story to this story of a particular family and the history of that family the history of the world, the history of the family of Jesus. They come down to Bethlehem, and they're in a manger, and they're wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger because there was no room in the inn. Then it kind of jumps back out to now a regional story again. In verse 8, it jumps out a little bit. The view, the perspective comes out, and it says, in the same region, in that same region of Bethlehem, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And I couldn't help but this week, I never really thought about this before, but I was wondering if those shepherds out there were probably saying, you know, one of us might strike it big someday. Remember, it was King David that was doing the same job we're doing a thousand years ago. King David was out here in these fields just watching sheep like we're doing tonight. And, and they're probably, and I, I couldn't think that was a normal conversation, but it had to cross their minds that from very humble beginnings, God chose whoever he wants you know your past has no bearing on what God can do with you? Your family, your education, your finances, your, your family name, 
any of that, God can take whoever he wants for whatever purpose he wants and raise that person up. As a matter of fact, the Bible says if we will humble ourselves before God, he will exalt us. So I say that to say if you think, well, I could never be big in the kingdom, I could never do anything. Yeah, you may not ever be king of Israel. You know the most important job you can do for the kingdom? This is a very, it's not a trick question. It's a very simple answer. The most important job that you can do for the kingdom is the job God assigns you. And whether that be sweeping floors, putting in your nickels in the offering plate, knocking on the door of your neighbor's house, moved in, bringing some cookies, and I go over here to Autumn Creek Baptist Church. We'd love to have you visit sometime. Whatever job God gives you is the job, the most important thing you can do. Don't ever let what the guy next to you is doing. Sometimes I look at Billy up here singing with that beautiful voice of his. <laughs> and that's why we have Danny on the drums. <laughs> that's why they have me out there. But I just think, boy, I'd love to be able to sing good and carry a, a, a song. And Kelly probably prays for that too. You know? <laughs> yeah, I wish you could sing good too, but... In any event, you know, I said, you know what? I just got to stick to the job God gave me. And you need to stick to the job God gave you. The worst thing you could do for the kingdom is not do the job God assigned you. And so we sit here as these shepherds, and they're probably kind of, eh, whatever, pastor. You know, okay, they're out in the fields, they're watching sheep. Who cares? What's the big deal here? Well, guess what? These shepherds are probably about to have a big deal. They are very close to having a pretty big deal happen to them. And it says in that same region of verse 8, there were some shepherds staying on the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. A couple of little shepherds, a couple of little sheep, they're out in the fields just watching their animals. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terribly frightened. I imagine that's exactly what would happen. You're out in the woods, and it's pitch black, and you can't see anything hardly, but maybe starlight, moonlight. And all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord with the Shekinah glory of heaven pops in and stands there before you. I got a feeling every one of us would probably just drop in fear. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I hear people say, well, if an angel of the Lord or if Jesus showed up, what would you do? I'd just go up to him and, how's it going, Jesus, and talk? No, you wouldn't. I don't think you would. Every instance we see in the Bible where an angel shows up, people are terribly afraid. There is a power there and an energy, and I think our spirit picks up on it that says, I'm, I think ultimately it's, I'm in the presence of a holy God. And without the blood of Christ, you had every reason to be afraid. But the message always from these angels, these messengers from heaven is always, almost the first thing they say out of their mouths is, don't be afraid. There's no reason to be afraid. I'm not here for what the angels in a couple thousand years are going to come for. Those are going to reap and harvest the world. We're not here for that purpose. We're here with a good message. You know, we, as we studied Revelation, we'll get back to it in January. One day there's going to be angels coming. This world should be terribly afraid because they're going to be separating the goats from the sheep and the tares from the wheat. And they will be here to reap the harvest and to cause and to be the instruments of judgment on the people that rejected Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that that won't apply to us? I love the verse, as much as I love John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave, his only begotten son. I love that verse. I also love in that same chapter, John 3, 36, 20 verses later, it says that he that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son, the wrath of God abides on him. I'm glad the wrath of God doesn't abide on me. I hope you today can say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I'm glad I've got the gift of God and not the wrath of God. Because every human being will get one or the other. They will get the gift of God or they will get the wrath of God. There is no middle ground in that. They will get something from God, his wrath or his gift. I can't stress enough, if you're here today, if you're watching at home or sometime in the future, accept his gift today. Something so simple. You don't, gotta know, you don't even have to know any words. I, gotta, I, I love the thief on the cross. Remember me. In your heart, it's so simple. If you, Father, forgive me a sinner. Bring me into your kingdom. You are instantly a new creation. If you mean that from your heart, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose again, and you want salvation, saying that word even in your own heart, just me, you may not even know the word, just God forgive me. That's simple. It's, it's right in our mouth to say. If you aren't there yet, please don't leave this building today or don't turn off the 
TV or your phone if you're watching at home. Don't turn off today without accepting this gift of God. So it says in that same region there were shepherds there, an angel suddenly stood before them in the glory of the Lord. And I, I can't imagine again what they felt about that. You remember this glory, this light, this light that shone round about was probably the Shekinah glory of God. Remember when Moses was out watching the goats and the sheep out in the wilderness and he said he saw a bush that was burning, it was lit like fire, but it wasn't consumed. And he went to check it out and he went and talked to the burning bush and the bush said, remove your sandals, you're standing on holy ground, that light that was there from that bush. When Moses went up to the mountain and talked to God and said, can I see you? And God said, if you see me, it'll kill you. And he hid Moses in the cleft of a rock and he said, I'll just, I'll scoot by real quick. That's Texan. God was talking scat Texan that day. I guess he'll, I'll scoot by real quickly and you'll just, you just catch kind of the tail end of my glory. And, and when Moses came down the mountain, do you, anyone remember what happened to him? It said his face shone so brightly they had to put a curtain over his face. They had to put a little curtains there when he looked at people. They said, I can't, I can't see. It's just blinding. How much glory does God have when someone's just looking on it? People say, I can't even stare at it. It's so bright. Maybe like, don't look at welding stuff, but probably like looking at a welding arc. You know, burn the corneas out of your eyes. But it was just a Shekinah glory. And we saw that glory at the burning bush and, and then in uh, Chronicles, in the Old Testament Chronicles, so when Solomon had finished the temple and it said the, the glory of the Lord descended on the temple and it said it just filled it with smoke and light and it was blinding and they had to run out of the temple. It was too much to take. We serve a God that's too much to take. You might be driving down the road singing a song or thinking a thought and if you're like I am, sometimes you just start crying for no known reason. And I think that's when your, your flesh says it's too glorious. God's too big. And my, and my body manifested sometimes with tears, sometimes with laughter, sometimes with joy. We just, Lord, I'm ready today. If you're ready, I'm ready. <laughs> Let it be today. And sometimes that, that glory comes upon us in those moments of our quiet time with the Lord or in fellowship with others. And there's just a joy, there's a peace that surpasses understanding. You say, my brain doesn't understand. Why am I so happy in this situation? And it might not be because the world looks at the situation you're in, but you're looking at who's with you in this situation. Once you become a believer in Christ, He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Any storm in life you're going through, He's with you. Any, any health concern that you're going through, He's with you. Any financial concern, He's with you. There's nothing you go through that He is not with you. Then the disciples saw that same Shekinah glory at the transfiguration. Remember Jesus went up the mount? And he went up on the mountain. And I think I shared that story some time ago. We were in some country in the Middle East. I won't say Lebanon. And we were looking at this mountain. And they said, that's, you know, that's the mountain. That's that ridge right there is where Jesus and James and Peter and John walked up. And where Jesus was transfigured. There, there's a cell tower up there now on the top of it. It's right on the Syrian-Lebanon border. And we were walking up, and we were just looking at that, and thinking, right there is where Jesus walked up that mountain. And then James and John and Peter said, let's build three booths, one for Elijah, one for Moses, one for Jesus. And they said they were transfigured. Their raiment was bright as white light. They couldn't even look at, upon it. It was just blinding white light. And as we, that's that place I had mentioned some time ago. If you weren't here before, I'll say it again, where the, uh, they came in almost like a, like a movie. They said, are you all Americans? This was during the 06 Hezbollah War. We said yes, they went and locked the doors, turned the clothes sign. You know, our, our energy started going up, our fear, so silly. And they came over and said, are you Christians? And we thought, boy, in a time of war, we're American Christians right on the Syrian border. During a war, what do we say? We said, yes, we are. And then the guy came out and he had a little Quran book and he said, we know this is a lie. We need the truth. We've asked Christ to send We've asked God to send Christians to us to tell us about Jesus, tell us about Jesus. That's the kind of glory that we have. Why would God reach out to six or seven Muslim men in the middle of a war? One guy was from Syria. He knew nothing in English. One guy was translating. And he translated the story, and they all right there just started tears of joy crying. I, I'm okay with God now. God, I, accept, I come to God through Jesus Christ. No more Korans for us. We need the Bible. So we, luckily we had some Bibles in Arabic. We gave him some Bibles. 
But th that's the glory of the Lord. And as much as we say, why would God save them? Why would God save you? There's no reason he would save us. Here's why. God is love. It's, it's not our nature. It's his nature. It's his nature to save. You will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. An angel stood before them and said, be not afraid. Verse 10, I bring you good news of great joy. Who's ready for just great joy? <laughs> we live in a world that, man, you, I don't even watch the news. You start watching the news in five minutes, you're miserable. This story and that story and more disaster and more pain and more suffering and more... The, this world doesn't offer any good news. You know what makes the news in this world is bad news. You get a story that's good news and it's rare because it's... Normally we don't hear good news stories. We hear bad news stories. Someone this week, I think I got this from Billy, he said... Do you have a good word? And I said, Jesus saves. And the bad news is bad. And that's what makes the good news so good. Jesus saves. The angel said to them, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. Earlier we saw Caesar Augustus, everyone, all the people go to the city of your birth, and you're going to be taxed. That's the world's news. Here's God's news. I bring you good news of great joy. It'll be to all people. Today in the city of David, in Bethlehem, there has been born for you the Savior, who is Christ the Lord. So as these people are hearing this, they're saying, well, we, we've been hearing all through our culture that Caesar Augustus is the Savior of the world. And he's taxing us, and he puts a heavy burden on us, and he puts st strict tax laws on us, and it's hard for us to keep in tune with what God's called us to do when he makes us do other stuff. And, and now they're starting to hear stories about that they, they're going to make believers in Yahweh and Jehovah kneel down before Caesar and give him offerings. That went on at one time where the world government said, you can have whatever God you want, but you also have to serve the gods of Rome. And that God is Caesar Augustus. And there were people that said, I can't do that. Folks, I think there's a time here in America we're going to have to start making those choices. What are we willing to do? that complies with, here's where I've decided, anything that doesn't go against this book, I'll obey. The moment a law goes against this book, I'm not following it anymore. That's kind of where I've come down on it. And so here it says, today, this is good news for you. It's, today in the city of David, there's been born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And in those three descriptive names of Jesus, Savior, Christ, and Lord, Savior is the true Savior of the world. Christ is the anointed king of Israel. Christ, as many of you know, I'm sure many of you know, it's anointed one. And you say, well, if he's Christ, or in Hebrew you would say, instead of Christ, that's Greek, in Hebrew would say Messiah. It's the one that's been anointed. When Samuel anointed King David, the word there is, he messiahed him. He, he covered him, he anointed his head with oil. He's a chosen one to be king. So here we read Christ is the anointed king of the world. And the Lord, the creator of the world. So Savior of the world, the anointed King of the world, and Lord, the creator and ruler of the world. That's the King we serve. He is all in all. When you have nothing and the only thing you have left is Jesus, that's when you're going to find that's all you need is Jesus. And sometimes he'll bring you to that spot. Sometimes if you put your faith in your bank account or your health or your strength or your wisdom, he will one by one start picking weeds out of your garden and to your conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ, and you say, not my will, Father, but thy will be done. He'll bring you to that spot. It's way easier to just accept and, and worship him regardless of anything. So the angels hear the great news of the, good, uh, the, great news of the story of Jesus Christ. In verse 12, this will be a sign for you. You will find the babe wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And so the sign there is you're going to find a babe wrapped in a manger. I was thinking... How is this night any different than any other night? How is this birth different than any other birth? And I started to think, well, I guess finding a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes in a food trough would, even by their standards, would be unusual. You don't normally put babies in an animal barn or in a food trough where animals are eating out of it. But they said, this would be the sign. You'll find this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly, in verse 13, there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. I got a feeling if they were afraid of the one angel, what do you think they did now? 
One angel comes, they're terribly afraid. All of a sudden, the whole heavens light up. There's possibly hundreds, a host, whatever a host means. I picture a lot. A host of heavenly angels light up, and they start singing and praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. That should be our natural, normal, what's going on, praise God. How are you doing praising God? What are you doing today? I'm praising God. We should wake up, never let a day go by. You don't praise God somehow, some way. Every day, seven days a week, we should at least, we're alone in the car, we're with friends or family and say, you know, I just thank the Lord for, I praise God because. That should be our normal conversation. Angels apparently do it. We're, angels are not redeemed. I think about that so often. All those demons that followed Satan out of heaven, when God kicked Satan out and a third of the angels went with him, do those angels have any hope? Jesus didn't die for those angels. I've heard people say, well, some, some years ago, someone told me this. I think if those angels repented and came to Jesus, he'd forgive them. Could you show me that, please? Jesus did not die for angels. Who did he die for? He died for us. A little bit lower than the angels. Is what the Bible tells us. He died for us. Again, I, I'm so baffled. Why would this king and savior and ruler and this being that has the Shekinah glory of the heavens and of God and is the perfect image of God, why would he die for me? The only thing I go back to is John 3, 16. For God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son. That's an, you talk about a Christmas present. That is, that's a Christmas present to the world. Verse 15 says, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying one to another, let us go straight to Bethlehem. I can see them saying that. Angels show up and saying, Bethlehem tonight is born to you, the king of the Jews, the Messiah, the savior of the world. I can see them saying, let's go check it out. And so they go to Bethlehem and they see, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry. When you hear good news, get to Jesus in a hurry. I said a little bit ago, the bad news is bad, and the good news is good, and the good news is good, because the bad news is so bad. Jesus is the Savior. G get to Him quickly. If you're not a believer today, get to Him quickly. Go check out this thing. If you have questions, there's men and women here today would be happy to meet with you. If you're at home, we'd be happy to have you call us, email us, contact us. I've got questions. We would be delighted to share with you this good news that was proclaimed 2,000 years ago to these shepherds, and is still proclaimed today. That Jesus loves you and wants you in his family. Also, I did want to make note, I think we've talked about this some, we'll talk about it again if you haven't seen, heard, seen or heard this before. These swaddling clothes, and I think it was, uh, I don't see Bob here today, I think it was Bob we mentioned a few nights ago at Bethlehem City, he was talking, he mentioned how uh, these swaddling clothes, remember they were in Bethlehem and I said it was five miles away from Jerusalem. Many of you probably have heard this story, but Bethlehem, those shepherds were very specific and when they had a perfect male sheep that was born, they would wrap it and keep it separate because this was the sheep they would bring to tr Jerusalem for the temple worship because the temple worship had to have a perfect male sheep. So they would take these strips of clothing when they found a perfect sheep that had no broken bones, no blemishes, no discoloration, was a perfect sheep ready for sacrifice, they would wrap clothes with it. And because they would give them to the temple, to the priest for uh, sacrifice, guess where they got these strips of cloth? And as Bob and I were talking about this the other day, Bob Warner we were saying that when the priest at Jerusalem would cut their priestly garments and the strips of linen, and they would cut the edges off and cut the hems, they would take these strips of linen and give them to these shepherds. And I find it amazing that when Jesus was born, he was actually wrapped in priestly clothes. Those, that swaddling cloth, that, those linen strips. And then Billy and I just a little bit ago was, I think it was Billy, saying, I can't help but think of that and thinking of John 20, when it said they went to the grave and they found the linen strips, the linen cloth laying to the side. That's why it's hard for me to view Christmas anymore. It's hard to see the cradle without seeing the cross in the background. He came, he was born to die. We talked a few weeks ago, why did Jesus come? He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to give his life a ransom for many. No one took his life. Jesus said, no one takes my life, I lay it down. He came to lay down his life for us. So it says in verse 16, they came in a hurry 
And they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this sight, they made known the statement which had been told to them about the child. I can't help but think that they told Mary and Joseph, probably everyone in Bethlehem, you won't believe what just happened. You won't believe what just happened was out in the, out in the woods out there. We were out with the sheep, and this angel showed up. Now, I suspect they were probably in Bethlehem because of human nature, like people today. When you tell someone, you won't believe, here's who I was, and then this guy, Jesus Christ, showed up in my life. And I turned my life over to him, and after that, I became a completely new person. Are there going to be some people that say, you're a nut? <laughs> human nature, there's going to be some people that reject the story and say, you're insane. And I can't but help but think when these shepherds, oh yeah, you shepherds again, right? Coming with your crazy stories from the woods. You came in town and said an angel appeared. Well, so they come and they tell the, do you think they were thinking, well, we don't want to stir up trouble. We don't want to have anyone throw rocks at us. And we don't want to think people that were crazy. Well, we better not tell anybody. Or the, the, Here's what the word tells us. They told everybody. When we have the news of what Jesus Christ has done for us, should we care what the world says about that message? And the answer is no. God's given you a, 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 a testimony. Faye, your testimony is different than mine. Mr. Vidler, your testimony is different than mine. Kelly, my wife, Lauren, I look around the room, everyone in here has got a different testimony. Who knows your testimony better than you? Other than Christ. Nobody. Who can tell your story about Jesus Christ? Because your story is His story. He's redeemed you. He's called you out of darkness into the kingdom of His glorious light, of His Shekinah glory. We should be excited about that and tell the world what Christ has done for me. The shepherds came and said, here's what God did for us. He sent us angels to tell us about this story. And we came to Bethlehem to look for this baby. And here we see this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And we want to tell everyone the story. Verse 17, it said, when they had seen this, they had made known the statements which had been told them about this child. They told people the story. Their relationship with Jesus, their interaction with this story, they told people. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told by the shepherds. When you tell people the story, they may reject it. They will think about it. Some people will accept it. You might be that, that fruit that brings some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. What that's talking about is bringing other people into the kingdom with you. Christianity is not a private religion. When I hear people say, well, you Christians, just keep your story in the church. Don't be out in public. Don't share it. Don't put nativity sets. I can't remember where it was I saw this week. There was some city that put a nativity set up at the, their town square. There was a church that put a nativity set up, and the city ordered to remove it, and they've got lawyers involved and judges involved, and you have to remove it, and they said, we're not going to. This is a story that must be told. What better time than Christmas? There's some people that take bold stands on it. I'm not saying that for us to do that. I'm, we should do what God tells us to do. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God. Isn't that a good de depiction of what happens? Just like the shepherds, we should go back and everything we do, glorifying and praising God for all that we have heard and seen. The text says they went back praising God and thanking God for all they had seen. Have we seen miracles in our lives? I mentioned this a few weeks ago also when someone says, well, I think during that Chosen series where Jesus said uh, to the man in a few weeks ago in our Sunday school class, we were in Mark, I know we're in John now, we talked about the guy that was crippled, and Jesus what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or pick up your bed and walk? If I could just see God raise someone who had broken legs and heal them and see a miracle. You know when someone walks an aisle and says, I once was dead, but now I'm, I'm alive, spiritually? A good doctor can fix a leg. No doctor can make a dead man alive. Only Jesus does that. If you're a believer, if you're a sa saved, and you're a new creation, you've got new life in Christ forever, what more miracle do you need to see? You once were dead and are now alive. That's the biggest miracle you, I, I can imagine, a dead person coming to life. So you can go out and tell your story to the world, and all that heard, they had told the world, all they had seen and heard, they told everyone they could, just as it's been told by them. So folks, this Christmas season, I would encourage you, be bold in your witness. Don't, don't be a, hit people over the head with a Bible. That, 
doesn't work. I've tried it, and I'll tell you it doesn't work. We just go and talk to people and tell them, here's what Christ has done for me. God sent his son into the world to die on a cross for my sins. And he, and he sent the, his son into the world to die for your sins. And if something so simple, and what about dinosaurs? Well, I don't care about dinosaurs. That's not what we hear about today. People always, how old is the world? I, I, don't, I wasn't there. You know, I don't know. Here's what I do know. Jesus Christ died to save sinful people. Do you accept or reject? And just, if they say, I reject it, you've done your job. You've told. We can save nobody. All we can do is tell the story. That's what God holds us accountable for. So this is, we go into 2023, let's each of our ministries, let's each of us as individuals, members of Autumn Creek or visitors, if you haven't joined, if you haven't joined, it's time. But if you haven't joined, if we come here, the, the group that meets here, this 2023, because folks, I do think the time is short. I know at 58, I've only got hopefully 20 some years left, maybe even myself. I know even Christ comes back or he calls me home, time's short. I, I want to bring the 30 and the 60 and the 100. I want to tell as many people as I can about Jesus Christ. And I hope as we now, 2023, we just start saying, what are we doing as a church? How are we reaching our community? Let's get more and more bold. Well, let's encourage one another daily. Let's pray for one another daily. We live in an evil age. God has done everything he can do for us at this point in sending his son. Now we're Acts, I, I don't want to say Acts 28, but if you know what I mean. But we are now the church in action. Let's be in action in 2023. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We so praise you. We glorify you. We bless the name Jesus Christ. We lift you high in our words and in our deeds. Help Autumn Creek as we move forward in 2023 and each people, each person here today and watching at home, that we would deeply and sincerely commit, recommit to 2023 being the year that we reach the lost, that we make that a focus of our church Father, we number, again, as I said earlier, number one, that we praise and worship you, and number two, bring other people into that relationship. Help us start inviting our friends and our neighbors and our family and those in our neighborhood, whether they go here or some other church, a Bible preaching church, get involved, get plugged in, and help us be busy making disciples. Father, again, we thank you. We ask a blessing on each one that's here through the end of the year. Some of us may not return next week as Christmas Sunday might be out of town or traveling. Father, help us return all safely, quickly, and we could fellowship together. We ask all these names in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.